the details of the temptation of Jesus, looking at some of the details. And this is a fairly, for lack of a better term, this is a fairly standard take on the temptations. Uh, it's not uncommon to see the temptations of Jesus uh, set forth in the, in the way in which uh, they're set forth in this particular uh, uh, lesson uh, as regards the, um, or in regard to uh, 1 John chapter 2, which tells us, you know, uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, you know, all the, the uh, you know, those that love, uh, all the things that are in the world are not of the Father. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And these things are not of the Father, but of the world. And so you see, you see these three principles in 1 John 2 and verse 16. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. And you see oftentimes, and you see it in this lesson, that the temptation, or the, the period of temptation recorded here in Matthew 4... Uh, follows that uh, follows that line of thinking, and so if you've read it all in the if you've read it all in the lesson and prepared yourself, you already know that that's the, that's the course that uh, that the lesson takes. And so looking at looking at these uh, looking at these things uh, the, with regard to the details of the temptation, we closed last uh, Sunday looking at the fact that the Holy Spirit uh, uh, was. Uh, uh, the impetus or, or uh, the having, having a lead role in this particular situation. We noted that as a man, uh, as a man, Jesus was subject uh, to the will of God, uh, even though he was both God and man. And so we noted as we closed last week that it says that he was driven by the Spirit, Mark's account says, led by the Spirit, uh, in Matthew and Luke's account, but whatever, however one wants to uh, look at it, the Holy Spirit, Jesus was following uh, the leading, in this case a direct leading of the Holy Spirit. And so looking at the three temptations in the, looking at the third paragraph under the details, uh, it says that, uh, uh, notice, uh, says, notice how the three temptations Satan used against Jesus fit into the three broad categories. Uh, first, a physical test, turning the stones into bread. Uh, that, and of course, that's, that's equated with the lust of the flesh. Then the spiritual test, jumping from the temple. Uh, uh, and then uh, 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 the pride, that'd be the pride of life. And then the, uh, what he, what's called a compromise test uh, with regard to the devil showing Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, offering those uh, to Jesus uh, as a reference to the lust of the eyes. I think uh, it bears noting uh, that the devil had uh, the devil had the ability and the authority to hand over all those kingdoms to the Lord. If, if he didn't, in other words, if, if somebody tried to, to bribe us, or tempt us, but we knew they didn't have, they didn't have the means, uh, well, I'll just put it this way. If, 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 if all y'all know me and you know about, about where I stand financially, and if I offered you a million dollars to do a thing, it wouldn't be much of a temptation, would it? Because you know that at, if you decided to do it, I don't have a million dollars. I mean, it's, in other words, it's obvious I don't, have, I don't have the goods to back up the offer. Well, the devil obviously had the goods. He had the he had the ability to to give Jesus the things that that he tempted him with, and so and so I want us to under, I want us to understand that that it was a very real temptation in in so far as the devil could have delivered on his promise. Now whether or not he would have delivered on his promise is a totally is a totally different situation, totally different situation. Because we know that the devil's a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning. But just because the devil is a liar doesn't mean that he never keeps his word. You know, uh, uh, in other words, a person who, a person who is, a, is a known liar uh, can, only, can only deceive people insofar as at some point in time he has to keep his word. 
I'll just give you, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a personal example of this. Uh, my dad was a pathological liar. He, you know, if, if I were to, to describe him uh, as Jerry, as Jerry Clower used to describe New Gene Ledbetter, he'd climb a tree to tell a lie when he could stand on the ground and tell the truth. All right. Now, the problem, the problem, obviously, besides being a liar, the problem was that every now and then he'd say something outlandish and it ended up being true. And I'll give you an example. There was one time, and man, this has got to be at least 40 or 45 years ago. Uh, but I remember it. Listen, I remember it like it was yesterday. And, I, and the reason I remember it is because uh, my cousin and my uncle and I were talking about it just last year. That uh, my dad had, had told my uh, uncles and my cousin that he had, uh, he had a, uh, a line on getting some really nice guns, some high dollar guns. I'm talking about like, you know, really nice Weatherby's. Uh, for example, one, uh, one was, for example, it was basically an elephant gun. It was chambered in 458. You couldn't even, I mean, back in, back in the 70s, back in the 70s and early 80s, it was $2 a round to shoot that gun. Now, it costs you $2 now, which is what, still too high, but the fact that it cost $2 a round to shoot that gun in the 70s gives you an idea of, of what... And so my dad comes through with this idea that he's going he's to produce all of these high-dollar guns. All right? So, you know, my mom's brothers, they're like, you know, they've known my dad for years, and, and they're like, sure, whatever, Joe. Well, guess what happened about a week later? My dad shows up, and my dad drove big old, one of them big old Cadillacs that you couldn't hardly park in this, in this auditorium. I mean, it, it was longer than a pickup truck. And my dad shows up, and he pulls, he pops a trunk on that car. And there's literally thousands of dollars worth of guns in the back of his car. And that's what made my dad dangerous. Because every now and then, he would come through, you know, again, some outlandish scheme that he had. And then all of a sudden, the moment you think he's not going to come through, he comes through. That's what that's what makes a that that's what makes a liar dangerous, is that he comes through every now and then. If he never comes through, nobody will believe anything he ever says. And so the devil's a liar, but the devil had to have had to have the ability to deliver on his promise to to give Jesus all of those kingdoms. Else it wouldn't have been a else it wouldn't have been a temptation at all. Okay, and so so we want to understand that from that perspective. That it was indeed a temptation. Secondly, I want to note this before we ever before we get started, uh, or really deeply into it, and that is, it would be completely wrong-headed to think that this is the first time Jesus was ever tempted. I mean, about we've already studied this to some extent. About how old was Jesus at this time? About 30. I mean, the text says being about 30 years old. Right? You know, who makes it to age 30 without being tempted? The answer to that question is nobody, right? And so just because this is, this is an, uh, a, a recorded period of temptation, a detailed time of temptation, we have to understand something. Jesus had been tempted many, many times before. There was, there was something special about this temptation with regard to the circumstances, with regard to the timing, all of those things. But look, Jesus had brothers and sisters, therefore we know he was tempted. Isn't that right, Brandy? When you got, when you got an aggravating brother, you're going to get tempted. Or in, our, in my case, an aggravating sister. You're going to get tempted. So we know this was not the first time Jesus was ever, was ever tempted. This is just a particular account of a special time of temptation for Jesus. Third thing I want us to think about is this. You know, at best, 
At bed, and I, I call this, I, I call this, I, I made this point on, on my paper. Uh, I call it the fight card. The fight card. Any y'all ever grow up? Anybody, anybody watch boxing? Still, or, you know, very few people watch boxing anymore. But when I was a kid, man, boxing was it. It was on every Saturday. You know, all the big fights were on public television, and we call it the fight card. All right, and they call it the tail of the tape. So what does that mean? Well, they talk about the tail of the tape. Well, they're going to tell you how old each fighter is. They're going to tell you what record each fighter. Has. They're going to tell you how tall each fighter is, uh, how much each fighter weighs, how long the reach is on every, on each fighter. In other words, there's going to be there's going to be this listing of of comparisons between between the two combatants, you know, which is why I never believed Leon Spinks actually beat Muhammad Ali. He'd only fought six professional fights, and Muhammad Ali was the greatest heavyweight that ever lived. I think that whole thing was a hoax. All right, the, the tail, the tail of the tape. I see you grinning back there, Esquire. You know I'm telling the truth. All right, the the tail of the tape said Muhammad Ali should should have wiped the floor with him. All right, now what's the tail of the tape here? You got Jesus as a thirty year old man, right? With about just at best, let's just say he's a thirty year old man with. 15 years of experience as, a, as, a, as an accountable being. He's a 30-year-old man with 15 years experience living as a, at least a semi-adult. And who's he going up against? Who's he going up against? Who is it? The devil. How many years experience he got? At that point in time. <laughs> about 4,000, right? <laughs> I mean, you think about it. Here's a 30-year-old man who's lived in a fairly sheltered home, in a fairly sheltered environment, going against the prince of the power of the air you know, with 4,000 years of experience in the temptation department and a list, and a list of victories so, so long... There's not enough paper on the world to, in the world to list them. I mean, this was I mean, this was a battle of epic proportions. And and by all accounts, by all accounts, the devil had the upper hand every step of the way. But he had something on his side that the devil didn't have. What's that? God. What's well, right? But but he did, just like we all do. But we all don't always win, and so just you know, just because we have God on our side does is not a guarantee of victory. It's, it, it's only it's only it's only the, the the possibility of victory. All right, and so this is you know this is a spiritual battle of epic proportions, and then on, you add all and we talked about this last week. All the other things that you add in on top of that, forty days in the wilderness, nothing to eat. I mean, there's so many, there's so many things, and we don't want to rehash them. But I just want you, I just want you to understand. I just want you to get. I want you to get a big picture of what's going on here. You know, it's not just, a, it's not just as simple as the text reads to us. If we start digging in and thinking about these things, and so this idea of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye, and and the pride of life. Now. Uh, um, We'll deal with some things on the, on the second, on the second, on the, or I guess it's the last second, which is also the last page. But let me, let me give you, let me give you a different perspective on this. And by the way, this is not me. This is William Barclay. Barclay has probably one of the most popular uh, commentaries on the Bible. And, and here's, and, and, and this is in essence, this is how, and I, I wish I had written this down. Because I was studying Barclay the other day, and I called Bill, and I said, have you ever heard such a ridiculous thing in your whole life? And then you turn right around on the next page, and Barclay has some, some take on a, 
on a thing that just absolutely astonishes you. And, and, uh, and Bill said, he said, Wayne Jackson wrote in one of his articles, he says, Barclay, will, uh, he will amaze you with his insight on one page and astound, basically, and astound you with his stupidity on the next. Well, he had an interesting take on the temptations. And I wrote them down because I thought they were worth sharing because they're not the standard, they're not the standard take. I've already given you the standard take, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. But here's Barclay's take. Here's Barclay's take on it. The idea of, uh, he talks about with the, the, the temptation of turning the stones into bread. And he called this the bribery of the material. The bribery of the material. He says, uh, he talks about John, uh, and I wrote down John 6, 26 and 27. You remember when Jesus, you know, Jesus fed the multitudes on two occasions. But in John's account in John chapter 6, they tried to make him a king and so he slipped away and went to the other side of the lake or the sea, which is also at times called the lake. And then the people skirted the lake and they found him. And they basically said, what are you, Master, what are you doing here? And here's what he said. You have sought me because you ate and were filled. They weren't seeking Jesus to hear more of his teaching. They were seeking Jesus because he had fed them and they had all been filled with, by means of the miraculous. And so it was good for them. In other words, it was easy for them to continue to follow Jesus as long as he would what? Keep feeding them, giving them food. Yeah, materially feed them. As long as he would materially feed them. In other words, they, were perfect, they were perfectly content to do nothing except follow him around as long as he continued to feed them. He wanted to spiritually feed them. That's right. So he's, con you know, and by the way, he contrasts those things in, in chapters five and six, you know, the, 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 and, and also in chapter four with the Samaritan woman with regard to the different kinds of water. You know, there's a water that you can drink that'll quench your thirst for a little while, but you'll be thirsty again later. And then there's a water you can drink that will turn into, a, 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 it says, a spring or a well, you know, gushing out under eternal life. And so Barclay talks about the, 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 the temptation of the bread as, uh, as a, a temptation to the material. And I thought about this, you know. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second. The prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel, it's, pretty, you know, it's, pretty popular, it's a pretty popular message and has been, by the way, has been for a long time. But have you ever considered that the prosperity gospel preys, preys upon the most base and worldly and earthly desires that people have? In other words, the prosperity gospel doesn't call, doesn't call men to a higher standard of living morally. It promises them a higher standard of living material. And, it, and, it, and it, again, it takes advantage of people's base instincts. More money. Better health. Uh, uh, you know, you know, whatever, you know, whatever we might fill in that blank with. And so as we think about, we think about the, the material, uh, the prosperity gospel. Uh, it says, uh, I wrote, let's see what I write here says. It does not call men... To a, I think I just said this, does not call men to a higher standard uh, of living. And here's, and here's Barclay's uh, uh, statement. This is what I wrote down. The task of the gospel is not to produce new conditions, but rather to produce new men. And with new men come new conditions. Now let that sink in. The task of the gospel is not to create better conditions it's, or new conditions, better conditions, but rather to create new and better men and with new and better men come new and better conditions. 
I thought that was really, I thought that was a really insightful take. All right. Then, then he talks about the, the matter of the kingdoms, all the kingdoms of the world. And by the way, uh, um, our lesson used the term compromise in, the, in this particular case. Uh, the, 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 uh, well, it, I said this lesson, it's probably in the, the companion commentary that I was reading. There's a lot more that, that's, that I have at my disposal than is just here. But he says, the devil understands that most would not accept Jesus. So he, and here's how he describes it. says, he played to Jesus' desire to save all men. In other words, knowing that most people would reject Jesus, including most Jews. He played to Jesus' earnest desire to save all men hoping that he would compromise his values in an attempt to reach more people. Now Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter 3 and verse 8. When he says, It is slanderously reported of us, let us do evil that good may come. Paul said that report is slanderous. Paul said, we have never taught, let us do evil, that good may come. But you know, are, people willing, are people willing to compromise their values or their morals by thinking that if I compromise in this matter, ultimately something good can come out of it. So the devil's playing on that. You know, you know, when, when people earnestly desire a thing, you know, no matter what, it, and it might, by the way, it, I'm not even saying it's a, it's a bad thing. It, you know, Jesus wanting to save all men was a good thing. But a lot of times, even when we want a good thing to happen, we can fall into the danger of compromising our values and our morals and compromising the will of God to what we believe accomplish a good, to accomplish a good thing. You know, listen, I'd love for the church building to be jam-packed full every Sunday. I think, I think most of us would. And there are, pro and there are probably some, some things that we could do that might lead us to that conclusion or get us to that, or help us to arrive at that end. But at what cost? At what cost? Well, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to give up some things. We're going to have to not teach on some things or, or give up teaching on some things or reverse our teaching on some things. So, you know... They left. What's going to happen if you're, you're feeding somebody something that gets you here? They're not going to stay here because they're not giving the right stuff. Mm -hmm. Which you'll most likely want. But they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what happens if they don't you know, If it's hot dogs today, it'll have to be hamburgers tomorrow. And if it's hamburgers tomorrow, it'll have to be steak the day after that. In other words, you have to keep, not only do you have to keep something up, you have to increase it. People expect, you know, they expect more and more and more. That's exactly right, Sean. Having wrong right, wrong motivation. Again, a full church building would be great. But, you know, at, but at what cost? And then the last temptation, uh, uh, as Barclay makes me of, he calls it the temptation of sensationalism. This was the one that I really found intriguing. If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down. Cast yourself down. In other words, do, do, something, do something so outrageous, so outlandish, so sensational that, that, that people can't help but be, that can't, they can't help but be drawn to you. That, I mean, that'd be something, wouldn't it? I mean... I mean, could Jesus ever jump off the, the pinnacle of the temple and not be seen? He could, in, other words, in other words, get up here on the pinnacle of the temple and jump off. And when people see, when people see you start to fall 
and all of a sudden you're like, you know, Bugs Bunny with air brakes, and you stop about a foot from the ground, and then either you just ease to the ground, or somebody, you get about a foot from the ground, and then some unseen force stops you, and then takes you back up to the top of the temple. Man, that'd be sensational, wouldn't it? It'd be incredible. And he calls that the appeal to sensationalism. Question, do we see that in the religious world today? The appeal to sensationalism. Sure we do. Sure we do. I, I would say I would say all of the all of the false claims about the miraculous are appeals to sensationalism. I would say all the fault all the false claims of of of, of, of uh, well not only of the miraculous but uh, you know you know financial windfalls are all appeals to sensationalism. Uh, I think the I think the lifestyle that many of these frauds live is an appeal to sensationalism. I mean, look. When you see Benny Hinn running around in a $20 million jet, that's an appeal to sensation. You know, wearing $10,000 suits in a $20 million airplane. You know, living in a $15 million home and got a million dollars worth of automobiles. And, you know, and Benny Hinn's not the only one. I mean, you could, I mean there's, a, there's, a, there's a host of people you could throw that you could throw out there. Uh, that's an appeal to sensationalism. That's right. People, people will look. You know, if it worked for him, you think? <laughs> you think? Me too. <laughs> I think. All right. So, so I think Barclay has some really interesting takes on really interesting takes on the temptations. Now let's go to the next page and move move toward the move toward the conclusion. The importance of the temptations, and here's some things that are not in your, that are not in uh, your lesson book or in your lesson, but I think are uh, helpful to understanding a few things. First, the temptations that are recorded for us in Matthew chapter 4 are not given to prove that Jesus was God. But to prove he was what? Man. You know, the, de the devil, you know, the devil kept throwing this out. If you are the what? Son of God. If you're the son of God, you know, he was appealing to he was appealing to the deity side. And so these temptations would have been particularly difficult for a person who was both God and man because Jesus knew who he was. And he knew what he was capable, he knew what he was capable of doing. But to do those things would only prove that he was God, it wouldn't prove that he was a man. And when you think about the very first, you know, the very first temptation, turn these stones into bread. And I never thought about this until, until this week. It, this never occurred to me. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But did, look, and it may have occurred to you a million years ago, a, th a thousand times over, but it never occurred, it never really, never really struck me until uh, preparing this week. When Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, who was he talking about? Yeah, I know he's talking about human beings, but who was he talking about specifically? Who's under consideration here? Ma'am? Yes, Jesus. He's, when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, he's talking about himself. He's talking about himself. He's not just talking about, I mean, yes, he is talking about mankind in general, but the point is he's including himself in that group. In other words, Jesus is, Jesus is affirming the fact that he is a man. That's exactly right. It is written.
Oh, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah the, 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 fast, the fasting portion leading up to the first temptation of bread is, again, in our minds, almost insurmountable. Almost, it's, it's like I posted on Facebook the other day. You know, if there is chocolate in the house, I will eat it. Yeah, I don't have any, I don't have any discipline in that respect. If I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. And I know I don't need to eat as much as I do. And yet, here's Jesus, not having eaten for 40 days, all the while having the ability to speak food into existence, right? He had the ability to speak food into, the, into existence. And here, and that, now look, and here's the catch. I said the catch. Here's the follow-up to man shall not live by bread alone. He's calling himself a man. He's including himself in that group of people. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying, apparently, it's God's will for me to be hungry right now. Is that right? I mean, I've been led out to this place for this purpose, and I'm hungry. And, that's right. That's right. God's never hungry. And he'll never say, I thirst. That's right. So, so what Jesus is not only doing is, not only is he including himself in the, in the category of humanity... He's saying, it's my understanding that God wants me to be hungry right now. Because I'm hungry right now. And if it wasn't God's will for me to be hungry, I wouldn't be hungry. And so, man, there's just, there's just so much to think about when we think about when Jesus makes this statement. You know, it's not, and look, I've been as guilty of this as anybody. It's not just Jesus tossing a scripture out at the devil... To, to, to refute the temptation, there's so much in it. Why did he pick that scripture? You know, why did he pick that scripture? Why did he say it the way, you know, it, at, at that time? Showing that he was a man and showing that he understood it was God's will for him to be hungry. Therefore, I'm going to, I'm going to keep on being hungry until God decides I don't need to be hungry anymore. I mean, obviously he knew God wasn't going to let him starve to death, Right? He knew that wasn't going to happen. And so, so he understood and believed it was God's will for he, him to be in that situation at that time. Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, I have been hungry and I've been full. Right? What did, Paul, what did Paul mean by that? He meant there were times in my life God intended me to be hungry. And there were times in my life when God intended me to be full. And, and, what, you know, and whatever, you know, whatever situation I find myself, in which I find myself, I will be content. You know, God saw fit for Paul to be free. And God saw fit for Paul to be in prison. God saw fit for Paul to be in health. God saw fit for Paul to be beaten, not in good health. Paul said, all these things I've learned to be content. In other words, I, I accept these things. I accept these things as the will of God because I know that God, God is using me through these things for the betterment of His kingdom. And so I, it had just never occurred to me that, that that statement about that Jesus believed it was God's will for Him to be hungry. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's powerful. It's powerful. All right, um, all right, next Next week, we'll finish this lesson. We'll do the questions. The questions won't take long. We go into lesson 12, okay? Next week, we start, and we'll go into uh, lesson 12. We've, and by the way, we've already talked about quite a bit of what is in lesson 12, uh, this, uh, but we'll do the practical application of it uh, more so uh, than the other. So and I'm not going to say we might get through lesson 12 because I know, I know myself too well. So, but uh, we'll start it nonetheless. You know, filling up 